Uh, I wanted to go back to roster construction here um, in the draft, in, in bringing this all back to, to what we're talking about here, the fantasy draft and uh, managing your fantasy team and becoming a better fantasy hockey manager. So I wanted to bring it back to roster construction and ask you if you had any specific drafting strategies um, when it comes to drafting your fantasy team. So obviously, uh, I think we've already touched on uh, for sure. Don't pick goalies high. I know another one that people commonly use is um, taking players at positions where there are less high high offense players at that position. What I mean by that is take centers late because there aren't as many wingers available high. So uh, is that something that you do? What are some of your strategies when it comes to the draft? That was uh, my rule number three. So I have uh, four draft rules. Uh, There's probably going to be more as I continue to do it. But just to start with last year, the first one was don't draft a goalie in the first two rounds. The second one was you need two, at least two elite power play quarterback defensemen uh, and I've gone through this. I had, uh, I've lost John Carlson for the season. I've lost Zach Wierenski for the season. Luckily I stashed, uh, Charlie McAvoy cause he's pretty much saved everything for me at this point. But if you, if you have injuries, like people are getting into injury trouble right now, there's guys going down left and right. You need to have two elite defensemen mainly to boost your offense because those defensemen are more rare. You're less likely to find those on the wire. Um, you know, I like to highlight there's guys like Vince Dunn, who's kind of come off the wire and he's been very productive. You can find those, but you should treat that as like a D three, not your top two elite defensemen. Uh, and then as you just mentioned, the, the centers over wingers, that was one of the videos I did for strategy. And it basically does come down to the fact that there's, I did an analysis and there's, uh, usually like 3.4 to 4.4, uh, right wingers that are putting up a 40 goal pace and centers. There's a lot more of that. There's like seven or eight centers per year that put up that kind of a pace. So even if you're not going to find them on the wire, you're going to find them deeper in the draft. I, you know, I picked Pasternak in the third round. I don't know how he dropped to me, but like I have McDavid and Pasternak and they're carrying my team. And obviously, you know, you get fortunate with McDavid, but um, you know, those, the, the centers that you can find later, you can pick them up if they're just going to get you assists or power play points or whatever, if that's going to help you out, that works too. You don't have to necessarily have a goal scoring center, but you need those goal scoring wingers because they're very rare. Uh, specifically this year was right wingers. But one thing that I've kind of found is that there, with the increase in scoring, there are more wingers that are putting up a lot more points. A guy like Carter Verhage is a perfect example. He's, you know, on a career season goal wise. So you can find them, but you should try to bank on getting them in the draft and prioritizing them up front instead of hoping that you're going to find something later on. Right. And another question, just building off of that is uh, positional flexibility. How much do you value that? Obviously, if you're between two players, one guy is only a center, the other guy is a center right winger, you're going to take the guy who plays two positions for maximum flexibility. But just how high do you value positional flexibility in fantasy? I think it's important for waiver pickups. I think if you're building your roster in the draft, like you want to just take the best player and then try to work out who you can filter in otherwise. Uh, It was interesting. I had a a conversation with somebody uh, before the draft. They were asking if they should not pick McDavid number one, if they should pick Dreisaitl because of the dual position eligibility. And I had to think about it for a second. I'm like, well, I guess in (laughs) theory, you could use him as a left winger. You could get another center that would maybe, but you can never pick, like you just should never pick anybody over McDavid number one. But um, in general, like I don't look at it too much going, you know, in the drafts. If, you know, if you're deciding between two players, it's nice to have a guy who's dual position eligible. Uh, a guy like JT Miller is a little bit more valuable because he's three position eligible. So that does help you, you know, especially maybe it's only five or 10 games max that you're getting more because you can get him in the lineup uh, just based on, you know, using any position that you have. But it's not going to be the be all end all. You want to make sure that you're getting the quality players that are going to put up consistent production for you year, you know, the whole year, not just a, a chunk of the season. Right. So I shouldn't be overly excited then that Travis Konechny just got winger eligibility or center I'm, eligibility on top of right wing. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little excited. I picked him. I got a waiver claim in on him right now because he's ice cold. <laughs> yeah, he is ice cold. And I tried to sell high on him. Uh, I had him in both of my leagues. I in, in our boys in the booth league, I traded 
him and a sixth round pick for Victor Hedman and a 12th. So that was a fleece, I, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but now he's he's ice cold and I couldn't sell him in my other league. So I don't know. I guess I have to hold him. But now at least he has dual eligibility up front. I'm kind of hoping that he turns it around and I can get some more games out of him. But well, that brings yeah. me to the, the thing I was talking about today and over the weekend. Now's the time where these terrible teams are going to start pissing you off. Like if you're a fan of the Philadelphia Flyers, they're going to start winning games and like getting themselves out of the Bedard sweeps, sweepstakes. So if you're going to be pissed off about that, you might as well go pick up Konechny to kind of balance it out a little bit so you're not as pissed <laughs> when that happens. Because that, now's the time where all these crappy teams... The guys are getting more elevated roles in the top six on the power play and whatnot, and they start frustrating you if you're a fan because you want them to tank for Bedard, but they're going to start playing spoiler. So I was like highlighting that today, trying to get people's attention. Guys like Kirby Doc, uh, Konechny's pretty owned up, but you know some of those guys that are getting an elevated role on a bad team.